Welcome to another episode of the Richards Report. I'm Ted Richards. Many of my previous podcast guests that I've spoken with are people who have made it big, be it Andrew Welsh, who is only in his mid-30s, but has a property empire so big that he's now included in the AFR Young Rich List, or a successful fund manager like John Sevior, who's managing billions of dollars, or AFL champions like Chris Chris Judd and Joe Watson that dominated AFL for over a decade. These fortunate people have been on big salaries and they're probably pretty well set up for life. They may not even need to work these days if they don't want to. They probably work where they do because they enjoy the challenge and they're not content just sitting at home watching TV all day. And that's why the podcast guest this week is a little bit different. He's only 29 years old. He hasn't made it big in his field of work. He's no property mogul or a fund manager, but he plans on retiring in the next few years. Yep, in his 30s. How is this even possible? Well, it's all got to do with the FIRE movement. F-I-R-E, it's an acronym which stands for Financial Independence, Retire Early. At a time when people are holding off their retirement into their late 60s or 70s and working much longer than they would have liked to, and with parts of the country getting increasingly agitated and angry about what franking credit changes might mean for their retirement, there's actually a growing community of people that are doing the opposite. They're retiring early. The FIRE movement is exploding all around the world. And my guest today has a really popular blog where he shares his path to achieve FIRE. He calls himself the Aussie Firebug. Now, it's not about trying to work three jobs and not sleeping to increase your your, um, annual salary. It's not even about living a terrible life to save a few extra dollars. It's all about getting your savings rate as high as you can and as early as you can. The Aussie Firebug, he started about five or six years ago when he was, I think, around 23. He and his partner's nest egg is now up to over $620,000. I think that you'll be interested in this episode for a couple of reasons. He, um, he challenges certain lifestyle choices we all make in life and whether what people spend their money on actually improves the quality of their life. It's always good to learn tips from people about ways to put things in place to prepare for retirement with um, so many people put this decision off and here's someone that's incredibly engaged about their retirement. He, uh, he also highlights the importance of compound returns. He talks about the, the first amount of money that he saved was by far the hardest. But uh, as he keeps adding to this snowball, his re- investment returns are getting bigger and bigger and the snowball, snowball is building quicker and quicker. It's also good to reflect on changes that you, you can implement in your own life. You may not agree with every decision that he makes, but this podcast isn't about that. I hope you don't listen to this podcast for me just to tell you things that you already know. Uh, It'd be pretty boring if if that's all we did. As with all episodes, this is not financial advice. This is just for educational purposes only. Uh, If we speak about anything throughout the episode and you'd like to know more, then go to the Six Park website and the show notes will be up there. Okay, that's it from me. With no further ado... I'm Ted Richards, you're listening to The Richards Report, and I'm speaking with the Aussie Firebug. You're listening to The Richards Report, where we will speak with investment experts from around the country. We will cut through the jargon to allow you to make more insightful investment decisions for your future. This is The Richards Report. Matt, you're 29. I assume most listeners might think that you're still quite young. Even though people should, it's fairly abnormal to be so engaged about retirement at your age. Many don't even start to think about this until uh, probably it's too late. So what got you into this? When did all of this start for you? Well, in FIRE specifically, it was a little bit later, but early on in my life, I'd always been uh, naturally frugal and just a bit of a tight ass in general. Um, and yeah. I struggled <laughs> I struggled with, um, especially in my teenage years, not struggled, but I was always pretty good at saving like a few thousand dollars, but then really having no um, purpose for that, the the savings at that stage in my life. Like it was nice to, you know, buy some clothes or um, save for a car or something like that. But I didn't really feel like a, um, a sense of uh, purpose when, when I was saving um, relatively small amounts of money back in the day um, during my part-time jobs and stuff like that. 
And I continued that, like just being frugal and relatively good with money um, into my full-time career. And it wasn't until I stumbled across a book, um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, that I come across the term financially independent. And um, that really struck a chord with me. Like it really just a bulb went off, went off in my brain that you could buy these things called assets and these assets could generate you money, whether it be rental properties, shares, gold, cash, whatever your asset is. And you reach a point in your life where you have so many of these assets that they throw off um, so much money that you don't have to work anymore. And that really struck a chord with me. Um, and from that moment on, I, I sort of had a, a, a more of a sense and a more of a purpose of where of it, why I was saving um, money and what it was going towards and this long-term goal that I could look to achieve. And then in the fire space, which is sort of um, the extreme of that, um, I come across a blog called Mr. Money Moustache, which really uh, ignited the fire, excuse the pun, um, mm -hmm. for me to really speed up that financial independence. So it wouldn't take uh, 40 years of saving and investing and you could realistically get it done in 10 years or so. So compared to most, you're just uh, incredibly young to be so engaged in something that uh, so many people put off. And um, I just want to touch on the FIRE acronym, which I went over in the introduction, financially independent, retire early. But the R there, the word retirement in the acronym, I feel like it's a bit of a misnomer in that if you retire at 30 or 40 years old, potentially with 40 to 50 years left, mm. um, it says retire, but it's not like you're actually planning on doing nothing for 50 years, is it? No, absolutely not. This is, the word retire is probably, it's probably the wrong word, but this is the acronym that we have and that everyone's using. So um, this is what we're going with, but retire, retirement in um, a lot of people's minds means, you know, sitting by the beach, drinking pina coladas all day and doing nothing. Uh, but in the fire community, the word retirement definitely has a different meaning to it. It's not so much about, not doing any work because that would be, um, I don't know, you boring. couldn't live. Yeah, exactly. That would be extremely boring. Meaningful work is a staple, I think, of every human that you need to be doing something productive and meaningful um, to be healthy in general. Uh, but a lot of people don't do meaningful work in their day-to-day -day jobs. Now, if you're lucky, you are doing meaningful work um, for an income, which is which is awesome. If you wake up every day and you can't wait to get to work, then um, you know I think a lot of people would envy that. But the reality is that a lot of people um, don't wake up every day um, jumping out of bed to get to their job. Uh, so for me personally, and a lot of people um, in the fire community, the word retirement in a fire sense isn't so much uh, stopping work, it's doing work that you want to do as opposed to doing work that you're forced to do for an income. Okay. You identified the mid twenties. This is an important time in your life. Why is that? Yeah. So I think, well, every decade is a relatively, um, well, it, it is an important time in your life for different reasons for sure. Uh, but for me, I felt as though, and this is, I guess I was fortunate to um, discover fire so early and financial independence so early because I really are passionate and I feel strongly that you, your twenties is super important for you for you in general like just living your 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 best life as they say but in a fire sense as well it's it can be absolutely critical to um to leveraging the power of compound interest really if you look at um you know my website you can see the history of our net worth growing from uh negative uh 36,000 with my hex debt um, all the way up to what it is today, which is over 600,000. And the bulk of that um, portfolio really was made in the last two to three years. Um, so it was really, uh, we really supercharged and leapfrogged, I felt, ahead uh, because we um, prioritized getting that snowball started so early and adding to it aggressively um, during our mid to late 20s. Um, you've already kind of touched on one of the things that I wanted to talk about is that is things that people in their early, mid, late 20s are normally up to and that's kind of lifestyle decisions that they're having at that stage of life, whether it's backpacking, traveling, no mm -hmm. kids, you know, just balancing up those lifestyle decisions with uh, the fire strategy that you're going after. And uh, 
I guess, you know, at the time of recording, you're currently in Vietnam and you've got a big international trip ahead of you. Out of interest, is this putting your retirement date back at all? Absolutely. It, it definitely is. Like I, the thing is, and I guess some people from the outside might look at the fire community as a bunch of crazy people that save every single dollar to try to reach financial independence ASAP and live a terrible life. That might be the outside perspective or people that don't really um, fully understand it. That could not be further from the truth. There might be some extreme people that are like that, but I haven't met anyone that wants to live a miserable life just to reach a uh, number, like your your financial independence number, um, quicker than they could have and continue to live that miserable life. The whole point of FIRE is it really is a mindset change if you're not naturally frugal or you're not, um, you know, if you're a materialistic sort of person. It's 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 sort of like a combination of um, minimalism, um, uh, fruit frugality, uh, and good good finance all rolled into one. Because the purpose for me of fire and the reason that I do it, I want to be living a great life from the get go. There's no point in um, living this miserable life just to reach this, this date sooner, uh, you know, than you could have if, if you were enjoying a, a few luxuries. Now, yes, are, are there going to be sacrifices? Of course, there's going to be sacrifices. I don't think there's anything in life that's worth doing without sacrifices or else everyone, everyone would be doing it. So uh, back to your question, are we on our overseas trip? Yes, we are. I will say that very happily. We are currently in um, Vietnam. Uh, having a great time, and we are off to London this year to uh, for a working holiday. Now, is that going to delay our fire date? Yes, absolutely it is. Do I particularly care that it's going to delay our fire date? No, I don't. I, we've already built um, a fantastic portfolio during the last couple of years of work and investing and saving hard, and now it's time to um, tick off this, which was a bucket list item of ours, and we, even though we haven't reached financial independence yet, um, we're well on our way. And I, this just goes to um, strengthen the idea of FIRE that it gives you uh, freedom and some opportunities that you might not have had. Uh, so whilst we are away, which I take great comfort in, whilst we're away on our travels, it's really reassuring to know that I can look back at the portfolio and see that it's still spitting out dividends and it's growing whilst we're away. So um, even though we're having a great time overseas, you're still getting that passive that passive income. Exactly, it's pass- it's 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 back home and it's working hard for us. So I sleep very well at night um, knowing that, and I know I understand compound interest. So I even if we're on this trip for you know a few years, I, I really uh, feel comfortable and um, take great pleasure in knowing that we have already established a pretty decent size snowball that's going to continue rolling down the hill whilst we're away, which is the whole um, purpose and the whole power of compound interest. Um, so it's not about yeah reaching this uh, reaching this goal ASAP and living this miserable life and cutting out all the good things in life. It's not about that. Um, some sacrifices, yes, but um, I think you can be flexible and it's it, it can be as hard as you want to make it to be. Um, there are some people that you know are on the road to fire. That's that's they're taking it pretty easy in that they, they won't reach it for another 20 years, which is absolutely um, fine. Everyone's different. Uh, I think for me, it's about living a really good life now, but with the conscious of knowing, just making a few consciously smart financial decisions and really recognizing what's important to you and what makes you happy, because that's really the overall goal, goal is to be happy. And I promise um, some of the people listening that, and this goes for myself as well, that we spend money on things that really don't make us happy. Um, and it's just about looking at those and uh, identifying those, cutting those out of out of your life and focusing on the things that make you happy. Matt, um, the other dilemma that listeners may want to know more, more about is uh, probably another question that you commonly ask, and that's how to achieve fire and getting a foot in the property market at the same time. Um, young people your age, in fact, even probably people a lot older than you, trying to get into the property market, find it really hard. Um, to be fair, I think Australia is quite obsessed with property and mm-hmm. um, that it's also considered a form of status. Um, anyway, people take out these huge mortgages to finance properties and and the mortgage then becomes the immediate 
concern the immediate priority um, or even fact of just saving up a deposit, not so much what their retirement like might look like. So how can, um, I guess, this, this goal that someone might have coexist with, um, with, with the FIRE movement? Yeah, it's a really good question. Uh, are, you, are you in Sydney, Ted, or Melbourne? I'm, I'm in Melbourne right now. Melbourne, okay. Is that where you live? Yep. Yeah, okay. So I'm from the country, So, um, but, but I understand how expensive Melbourne and Sydney, for that matter, uh, properties can be. And when the bulk of the population is in those two cities, it is a common question, you're right, um, that I am asked. Uh, and to be 100% honest with you, if property is important to you, which I totally understand if it is, like for me, we rent, um, even though we invest in property, we, we don't actually have a prim- primary place of residency. Um, if property is important to you, you want that stability, you might have a young family and you want to do fire. And if you live in Sydney or Melbourne, it's going to be hard. There's no getting around it just because of how expensive the houses are. Um, it will delay your um, retirement date for sure, but it really just comes down to um, priorities and what's important to you and what's not important to you. Um, another sensitivity I'd like to touch on is that about implementing this strategy if you've got a partner. And um, I came across a great quote in my research somewhere in one of your blogs, something like, um, if you've got two savers in a relationship, it's Nirvana to spenders in a relationship, well, it's not actually that great, but uh, at least you're both on the same page. But one saver and one spender, well, that um, in a relationship, that spells trouble. So without going too much into your personal situation, is your partner on board with the fire movement too? <laughs> yes, thankfully she is. And it's a great quote, isn't it? I think it's um, a Peter Thornhill quote that you're mm-hmm. reciting there. Um, and it's a good one. But um, this is... Yeah, my partner, Mrs. Firebug, is definitely uh, on board. I think at the start, she, well, she's always been naturally frugal. Like, I, there wasn't, maybe not to the extreme level that I was at the very start, but um, she's pretty good. Like, as you said in the quote, I don't think, I just, I, I would find it really hard. And I can't speak from experience because it's never happened to me, but it would be very difficult to be um, in a relationship with someone that was, extremely bad with money and you know made all these uh financial errors or not so much errors but just was very uh would spend on anything and not budget and it'd just be difficult like i know relationships in general can um you know sometimes you got to sacrifice and meet in the middle with a lot of things but that that one would be extremely hard and i really this is sort of outside my expertise because um now we're getting into like relationship uh (laughs) counseling so i i really don't know like if you got if you're in love with someone that's reckless with money i i i I don't know go go see a professional or something that's um that's a hard one okay well um you combine combine snowball together is now over six hundred thousand dollars which you mentioned before out of interest how much how much do you think you need What, what will the goal be we're aiming for I'm, I've written about it a little bit before um, because it's not a hundred percent accurate. Like you can make predictions and look at the history and everything. Like the, of course there will be a bit of um, when we when we get to it we'll, we'll reassess. But I'm just aiming for um, the mill, the a um, million dollars just as a, a ballpark, and we'll see what it's throwing off at that stage and where we go from there. Um, later down the track, we both want to have kids in our life. So that's going to be, um, you know, throw a, a few more expenses into the mix. I can uh, vouch for that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, I'm just going to say a million dollars at this this point. And um, I, technically, from what we're spending now, like not this year overseas, because this is sort of a one-off thing, but from the lifestyle that we were living last year and the year before, and it was a great lifestyle. This was holidays were included in this. Like this, we that was the life that we wanted to live. With that lifestyle, we would need about um, seven fifty to eight hundred thousand um, in income producing shares. So ETFs and listed investment companies. We could realistically, based on historic returns, which I know 
it's not an accurate indicator of future returns. But if we had about seven fifty to eight hundred, um, we would be we could live our last two years of our life comfortably. Now going into the future, there's going to be you know a few twists and turns. So I'm just going to put it at a million dollars to be a bit more conservative, and we'll revisit it once we reach that. This episode is brought to you by Six Park, Australia's leading online investment manager. If you're thinking about setting up an investment portfolio, then go to sixpark.com.au and we will make an investment recommendation for you over Australian shares, international shares, infrastructure, property and bonds. It's completely free to take the Six Park Risk Assessment on our website. Simply go to sixpark.com.au. We manage the portfolio for you, execute all the trades for you and provide you with end of financial year tax reporting too. We also absorb all the trading fees so you don't have to pay for any trading costs. And as we know, it all adds up. So whether you're investing for fire or for your kids or to get your foot in the door in the housing market or even for your own retirement, visit sixpark.com.au. Okay, back to the discussion with the Aussie Firebug. I read somewhere that you said that your first $100,000 was the hardest um, that you saved. Mm. To be fair, that's quite a lot of money. Some people may say that the first $1,000 is the hardest. So can, <laughs> can, you, can you tell me about how old you were when you hit $100,000 and how long it took you? If I'm being honest, I can't – I think it was a little bit um, – it's a bit fuzzy in my memory, the first hundred thousand, um, because I can't remember celebrating it as like a real big milestone. Uh, but all I know is that saving that that first sort of hump, that first hundred thousand, or it could be a thousand or ten thousand for anyone out there listening, doesn't matter. But that that first sort of mental hump, um, I just remember it felt like an eternity um, to get there, and when I do remember the 200,000 quite well, it just come along a lot quicker. And then we're at 400,000 and now we're over 600,000. So it's, it really just speeds up, which is the nature of compound interest in general. Um, but it just seemed like it took forever to get out of hex debt, first of all, um, and to build that up. And then we, I, I built uh, my first property in uh, 2012, 2013. Um, and I just remember it, yeah, saving and um, seeing it go up in the early days felt like forever. And it just feels like now each year that it just keeps growing at uh, a faster and faster rate. So, Matt, I don't want people to, to listen in and just assume that you're on a massive salary and saving these type of numbers, these type of these size figures is, is actually quite easy. Um, this all comes back to your, your savings rate and it's not about how much money you're making. So, um. Mm. Out of interest, just so people can do some self-reflection, mm. what type of savings rate should people be, be aiming for? Yeah, well, I'll just let your um, you know audience know and to be super transparent, um, my wage has changed throughout my journey, of course, um, with promotions and um, changing jobs and stuff like that. But I haven't, not once have I earned um, much over 100000 I was quite lucky and fortunate to get a job straight out of uni that was relatively well-paying. Um, it, by country standards, especially of around about um, seventy two thousand straight out. So I was I was lucky then in twenty eleven, and then um, my wage went up to uh, close to a hundred thousand. Um, there was a few uh, bumps in pay there, like within the first uh, three four years, and then I actually went backwards and took a pay cut to move jobs closer to home to around about eighty seven thousand. And then recently, last year, I got a promotion and I'm back over the 100000 So it's just give, to give your audience, like, I, I, I don't want to sound like I'm bragging or anything here, but I really want to be... No, um, give some an important context. Exactly. So this we're not talking, like, depends on where you live and everything. Um, it's not mega bucks. Like, I, I have friends that are tradies um, that were earning double of what I was earning. What savings rate do you recommend people should be aiming for? Yes, so this is, as I'm glad you brought this up because this is, without a shadow of a doubt, the most important part to reaching, for reaching financial independence. The saving rate, the saving rate dictates everything and it doesn't matter how much you earn. There's a very good, um, it's a good article on Mr. Money Moustache's website and it goes something like this, you know, person A is earning 
uh, $60,000 a year. Person B is earning $270,000 a year. They both have a saving rate of um, 40%. Who do you think is going to retire early? Uh, yeah, who do you think is going to retire earlier? And the answer is they're both going to retire at the exact same time because the saving rate, it's it's two, two factors go into the savings rate. It, what it is, first of all, it's your... Um, the, how much you're able to save as a percentage of your income. So if you are able to save, if you earn $100,000 after tax and you're able to save $20,000, you have a savings rate of 20% of your after tax income. And the savings rate not only dictates how much you need to generate that income to sustain your lifestyle, but it also dictates how much you can get or you can take from your, your after-tax income and put it into investments. It's a two-edged sword because if you can save, if you can bump up your savings rate from, let's say, 30 to 40%, not only do you have more money to um, put towards building your snowball faster, but theoretically, if you are living on 10% less, you, you and, and the important thing is that you're still living a good life, you are theoretically can live off less. So that snowball has to produce less of an income for you to live your life you're currently you're currently living. So I don't know if that sounds confusing, but I hope yeah, that- Yeah, no, that- no, 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 that's, uh, that's, that's very clear. Um, so I've got a question here about implementing FIRE. And yep. uh, I want to start this question from a quote from um, Oscar Wilde, and that's, uh, I can resist anything except temptation. So uh, we all go through a certain decision-making process when we buy something. I Personally, I think about whether I, I want something or I actually need something. Mm. Um, you've been in this process for many years now, so the process is probably fairly automated. But um, what interventions or considerations do people need to kind of reflect on if they want to buy something? So uh, what I mean by, you know, are there any tips on how to break that, the habit of constantly seeking instant gratification by buying things? Everyone is different. Everyone has their own yep. different method. Um, me personally, I look at it, and this is very, this is a very fire way to look at it, I guess. But uh, at the very start, when I first discovered fire, I was I was way too obsessed. Like I was I was overboard, and I wasn't living a great life. I was actually restricting myself, um, and I've got a lot better later in life. But the way I look at it is. Am I going to buy uh, the the want and need thing that you spoke of is a really good one as well. But am I going to, um, is this thing that I want to buy because we'll stick with wants, is it going to make me happy? And, and this is where I guess I differ from like a lot of people or a lot of conventional um, wisdom, I guess, is this item worth the work required to put into it? And what I mean by that is, if I want to buy, let's say, a, I'll, I'll use a car for example. Let's say there's a really nice car, and you know I'm human. I look at a really nice car and I think, wow, that's like that's an awesome car. I would love to drive that. Like it's it's a, a natural thing to think of. But I look at it and I think, even though it would be awesome to drive and it looks really good and it's you know it's it's really it's really great, I am not willing to work an extra five seven years to own that car. That's how I look at it. Every every uh, want, I convert it into how many how many extra years am I going to have to work to reach freedom if I purchase this item? Okay, um, the fire community it's it's really growing and exploding all around the world, um, including Australia. It looks like it started in the US, and we've already kind of touched on Mister Money Mustache. That's been. Um, heavily prominent in in this movement. I actually listened to a great um, Tim Ferriss interview that uh, they did together. So he sounds like quite an interesting guy. But one of the things that he touched on was um, the retirement police. Can you can you tell me about those people? Yeah, that's it's a good um, it's a good topic. And I think Mr. Money Mustache is definitely I would say the most popular. But I think it actually started from um, uh, uh, early early retirement extreme there's a website with this guy that was, yeah, extreme with his early retirement date, um, and I, I think Mr. Money Mustache come later, but he, he's definitely the, the cult hero in the fire community. Um, so he talks about yeah, the the internet retirement police is a very, uh, it's a very interesting um, group of people that for whatever reason, 
they take issue with any fire blogger or anyone that claims that they've reached fire working for money. And as soon as you do anything, after you've reached retirement, as soon as you earn one single cent from anywhere, that automatically means that you're not retired and you're living a lie and you're telling people that you're retired at when you're really not. So they go around and they, they comment on people's blogs and uh, videos and articles and say it's all fake and um, you know these people aren't really retired. They're still working after they've reached their financial independence, which as we've covered, um, you know, retirement in the fire space is never about just sitting around and doing nothing all day. It's about reaching a point in your life where you can choose to um, work when you uh, on things and at things that that you feel passionate about, and when you um, want to work, want to do those work. Yeah, the funny thing about Mister Money Mustache that I, I saw is he's quite open in that he said even uh, you know he's retired from from work, mm. but um, his blogs become I think so popular and different other things that he does is that he's now making more money than when he did when he worked, which which I think is actually a fantastic um, if he's lucky enough to have that. So, um, And your blog is very popular too. Um, I, I read that you're not just getting a few questions a week now, but you're so popular they're getting a few questions every day. Can you just give me a bit of insight? Um, what are some of the common questions you get asked? Yeah, so um, that is right that the questions are coming in uh, now daily. Uh, which is fine. I, I definitely, you know, starting the blog was one of the best things I ever did, not only from a, um, you know, development of myself, but just the community is just so great in Australia, the fire community and the, the personal finance community. And it's really, um, as you said, it's it's exploding the fire community, like globally. And I feel as though it's definitely um, reached Australia and we've got a thriving um, amount of content out there. So, I, you know, definitely urge people to have a quick Google because not only my blog, there's heaps of other blogs that are out there that are, are really great as well. Um, so the, the common questions that I get asked, I get asked a lot. Um, a lot of people write in about their situation and they want advice about what to do, which I always respond to them that I'm not a financial advisor and I cannot give financial advice. And my blog is just the thoughts and opinions of some, you know, guy on the internet and this is what I'm doing, take it as you will. Um, but a lot of these, yeah, a lot of these people are looking for those specific advice, which I can't give. Um, and then there's a, a, a lot of people that ask um, just about, you know, how, how I invest and um, why I make decisions that I do, uh, which is, which are good questions because I can answer those. And um, if I if I get too many questions on some topic, I'll usually write an article about it. So that's usually um, how articles come about. Um, here's a question that I, I forgot to ask you earlier, which I'm, I'm really fascinated to know. How do most people react when you tell them that you want to retire in the next few years and then you tell them that you're um, you're 29? Because I'm sure that it's, <laughs> it's quite a sensitive topic. Some people might give you a bit of a strange look. Yeah, so I don't really go around telling people like hence the you know i'm anonymous on my blog which is yeah i just don't i, I don't I, I thought about it and i just i can't think of anything positive that would ever come out of it if i just you know started telling people now if they ask and if they prod i'm happy to tell them so i'm trying to think a real life situation here so obviously with my partner i had to tell like, not that I had to, I wanted to tell, you know, we're on this journey <laughs> together. Um, yep. So her response, I actually think that she she was like secretly in her head that this can't actually be done. And, oh, that's that's nice, Matt. You know, that's all right. You, just, you know, keep saving money. That's good. Um, but I don't think she really thought it was possible uh, at the start. And I guess with my parents as well, they were a bit like, oh, yeah, you know, good, good story, mate. Um, good luck with that. But uh, as you meet people, that have already reached because I was like that as well. When I read these blogs, I was like, "Is this actually legit?" Like to hear that you know at twenty nine, your uh, your nest egg is now over six hundred and twenty thousand dollars. This is not just um, a pipe dream. You're really putting things in place, yeah. And so, no. kind of a flow on question from that. Let's forecast ahead. Uh, let's say you've achieved fire. Um, let's say you're thirty five. The markets have done well. 
you stop working your current job, what would you like to do? Kind of, I'm, I'm, assu- I'm assuming that you'd probably consider uh, um, passions and things like that. Well, yeah, what, what do you reckon your days would look like? Yeah, that's a great question. And to be 100% honest with you, I'm unsure at this point exactly how it's going to look like, but a big, big factor for us, me and my partner, for pursuing this and to get freedom into our lives is to free up our time when kids come onto the scene. That's a very, very uh, big motivation for me. Huge motivation. I don't want to be going to work on four hours sleep and working Monday to Friday at a job that I don't necessarily want to be at. And I see it happen all the time at my job. And a majority of people do oh, it. Matt, Matt so, sometimes you're like, oh, oh, I can't wait to get to work. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, 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 oh, another, really? well, that's, that's another topic actually, altogether. Oh, uh, true. Okay. I, I see where you're coming from there. And um, that's a fair point. But I, I just want to, um, I guess I just want to have that, that choice about whether or not I do want to get away from the house or whether um, I want to stay and, you know, be there. Uh, for my kids. I really, it just comes about, it comes down to choice really. Um, So how my day is going to look like uh, when I have reached the point where I basically, I quit from a corporate job. Like I quit from the rat race because that's to me what the retire early part really is. I, I stopped the rat race and now I move, I transition my life into, okay, what do I want to do with my time now? I've got, you know, fingers crossed 40, 50 years left to really put effort into something that I'm passionate about and build something here. And who knows? I, I, like I've always wanted to um, start, a, start a business maybe or, um, you know, have a career change. Like it could just be anything. And I get really excited to think about what it would look like, even though I don't 100% know exactly what it's going to look like. But I want to be in that position to, you know, steer my own ship when I get to that point. Um, and the kids factor was definitely a big thing. Um, and, yeah, like, you know, volunteer work, Sure, like uh, I don't have anything specific in mind, but um, also, well, one one thing I know for sure is if the blog is still running, I would love to really spend more time and put more effort into the blog because I have so many things that I'd like to do, but I can't do because of just time restrictions. With you know, um, go, going to work is the main one, but you know, going to the gym, going to footy, and stuff like that. I just I only really spend like an hour on the blog if I'm lucky at night, so there's not a real um, a lot of time that goes into it. I'd love to to really um, get st- st- more stuck into that. Um, yeah, the, the opportunities are really endless and I, I really look forward to the day that I'm able to explore them to their full capabilities. If someone's listening in and they're thinking that they'd like to um, give fire a go, um, what's your number one tip to listeners? Without a shadow of a doubt, I say this whenever I get this question, track your expenses. Doesn't even matter if you want to do fire, if you think it's too extreme. Okay, that's cool. A lot of people do. Track your expenses, track your expenses though. I guarantee, I guarantee you that you will save money. Or and you will actually cut out stuff in your life that brings you no joy. Promise you. Memberships that you're probably paying for that you don't you didn't even know about that you, you might have been paying for the last year. You will find out about them. If you track your expenses, you don't know how how well you're doing. You can't plug the holes in your boat without tracking your expenses. And this is, if you actually want to achieve fire, this is imperative because you will never know how much passive income you will need per year unless you know to the dollar how much you are spending a year to sustain your lifestyle. So once you know, once you have that number, okay. You can say, all right, I spend $70,000 a year. We live a fantastic life. We spend $70,000 a year. How much of a portfolio will we need to generate $70,000 worth of passive income? Boom. You can can start working the, the mathematics. But that is my number one tip. Track your expenses. I, I think that uh, listeners, some might quite enjoy having their head in the sand and I'm not too keen to find out how much they are actually spending in on um, things like coffees. Yeah, and things like that every day. The coffees, uh, I couldn't imagine. I couldn't, yeah, it would it would make me nervous to, to think about how many, how much people spend on coffee and, and how much that's delaying 
how much that's delaying their freedom. <laughs> you know, that's I speak from a, a fire point of view, but yeah, it's um, like you do what you want with your own, your money. I get you know, spend what you want to spend, but for me, you know, sometimes I see co- people buy coffee for like seven dollars, and I just I die inside. <laughs> I think that's just a lot of money for for yeah, one drink, yeah. and anyway, that's just me. So getting getting wrapped up in the frugal talk. Now that that's tracking your um, spending, but also tracking your investments. So I've um, I saw that you love ShareSite. Now our clients here at Six Park get access to um, uh, Share ShareSite accounts too. What specifically do you like about ShareSite? Oh, I love ShareSite. ShareSite is the best the best reporting tool for Australians that I've ever come across. I think it's the best one out there. Happy to be um, you know proven wrong, but I have not seen uh, any any other bit of software that does it as well as ShareSite does it, and also factors in. This is what I love about ShareSite. They factor in Australian spe- specific stuff like franking credits. You sometimes you see. If you compare like Yahoo Finance or something like that, uh, uh, a um, historical returns chart, they do not factor in the franking credits, which is, you know, you can't make a judgment call about what to do without factoring in everything. So I love ShareSite that it does all that. Okay. um, Last two questions. Um, Any books you recommend um, listeners check out? Yeah, for sure. Um, Obviously, you know, there's the classic like Rich Dad, Poor Dad. If you're after, a, yep. if you've got absolutely no idea of financial independence, I would say read that book. It changed my life. Um, if you're into uh, property, I'd say uh, anything Stephen McKnight writes is fantastic. Um, I like the Boggleheads Guide to Investing as a general finance book. Um, so that's written by John Bogle, who actually passed away uh, a few weeks ago. And he's the founder of Vanguard Group, which is an investment investing company, um, a very popular one that create um, a lot of very popular ETFs. Uh, that is a fantastic book. It covers everything from, um, you know, personal finance in general to how to actually invest your money because the investing the money part gets all the limelight and all the glory, but really anyone will tell you that it's the savings that that is the most important part for reaching fire. It's not the investing. Uh, Matt, so where can listeners find out more about the Aussie Firebug? So my website is the best place to go to. That's uh, www.aussiefirebug.com. And you'll find everything about me on the website. I've also got a YouTube channel and a podcast that you can get um, anywhere you get your podcast. Just search me, iTunes, um, SoundCloud, any, anywhere you get your podcast. But the website is the go-to place to find out about me and to um, contact me if you want to. Uh, Matt, thank you so much for having the chat today. I really appreciate it. And um, I know that you're on holiday in Vietnam. So um, thanks for taking the time out of your holiday. And um, hopefully Mrs. Firebug isn't uh, unhappy with us. <laughs> she's by the pool, mate. She's she's very happy. Don't worry. <laughs> well, and, and all the best uh, with, with the holiday continuing in London as well. Keep an eye on your finances over there bit more expensive than vietnam yeah that's it's gonna be i don't know if we'll be saving much this year but hey that's you know it's not about that this year and it's um we just li- live in living out a bucket list item so we'll get back to it once we come back okay that's it for this episode thanks everyone for listening in if you think that someone might find this episode interesting or that they could learn a bit from what matt is doing then make sure you share it with your friends or even your kids Who knows, maybe it might plant a seed in their mind as uh, a way to increase their engagement in their savings and their superannuation. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe wherever you get your podcasts from to ensure that you'll receive all future episodes too. Okay, that's it from me. See you next time on The Riches Report.